Hi, Fred. Um, I made this tape after talking to you on the phone. You mentioned that, uh, that you had made one and maybe I should make a tape too. And I was already scheduled to give a presentation at the St. Michael's Church in Sacramento that does certainly share what uh, my experience is in Folsom Prison. Uh, my only desire really, you know, if I have a ministry at all, you know, outside of the prison is to tell people that Centering Prayer uh, has a role and maybe a very powerful role in the future of prison ministry, you know, for people that might want to choose to do that. You know, I'm not here to say how to get started or because uh, it's going to vary with everybody, you know, so I, I really don't have a plan so much other than maybe, you know, my hope is that this is at least maybe an encouragement you know, for some people, you know, who might have a heart for prison ministry and have a heart for centering prayer, you know, that it's something they might consider, that maybe the, the Lord would open some doors, that, that, that it's already begun, you know. So that's really all this is about. Um, I'm passing it on to you. Uh, I'll give you some ideas at least what's happening in Folsom Prison. For me personally, when I look back, there was a time where I was uh, going to a, a junior college, Lassen College in Susanville. And at Lassen College, I was there majoring in forestry, and I was also playing on their basketball team. And um, because it was a forestry school, uh, we used to help out with some of the firefighting. And I got involved with some of the fire crews that were there that were from a local prison. And I literally was assigned to fire crews at times, you know, during, during the fire season to help out on weekends. So I was able to interact with them, and, and the basketball team used to go over and play the prison team regularly. And as a result of that, you know, I was able to experience these men, you know, just as people, not as criminals, you know, but they were basketball players, you know. And, and during the games, you know, they were the fans, very enthusiastic fans, you know. And uh, the, the, there was interaction that I had between them at a, at a level, you know, that was just kind of like just being with, with you. you know, just people, I didn't know what they did or why they were there. But uh, the same with in fighting the forest fires, you know, where we were assigned to these men, you know, and I was with them, and I was just able to see them laugh, you know, and joke, and just a, an incredible human side to them, which, which planted a seed inside of me, and I never really realized that until much later. Um, we're going to move along real quickly here. I eventually got married, have four boys. My wife is sitting over here, and... As we were drawing towards an empty nest over time, you know, I knew that, that I wanted to do something, you know, once these boys were out of the house. You know, there was a lot of effort on my part, mainly because I just enjoyed, you know, sports and fishing and things. And we did a lot of things together, you know, and I put a lot of time and effort into them, mainly because it was simply enjoyable. But I knew that there would be a time where that void, I guess, in a sense, you know, should be put someplace else, and I really didn't know where it was for the longest time, you know, and there was a point where I was told by a man, kind of a spiritual director, who I trusted, and he said, if you're really going to go deeply over time in a spiritual journey, somehow we need to rub shoulders with the rejected part of our society, you know, whether it's, you know, handicapped, uh, whether it's the homeless, you know, whether it's prisoners, you know, just people that society doesn't accept, you know, and, and not so much that we need to help them, but they need to help us. You know, we have gifts to give, but don't do it because you have a gift to give. Do it because they have a gift to give you. And somehow, because I trusted this spiritual director of mine, you know, I, I kind of played out in my mind the different things I could do eventually once the boys were out of the house. And, and I did begin to lean towards prison ministry, and I really didn't know why, but in hindsight, I can see why, based on my experience over in college and uh, firefighting and playing basketball with these men, where you know, I was attracted to them. I enjoyed them. It wasn't a matter of, well, oh, I'm going to help these guys. I mean, I was literally attracted to be with prisoners after my experience, and it's only now that I look back that I realize why I had an attraction to prison ministry. And so I went over to Folsom Prison and harassed the priest for eight months. You know, until he finally uh, let me in, you know, I, you know, who am I? You know, I don't have a degree in anything, you know, that was going to help me in prison ministry. 
but I want I just wanted to be there. I just wanted to be with them. But somehow a door opened and, and I went on in and just started doing some things over a period of time. And then my wife and I, uh, we have some neighbors that have a cabin up at uh, Lake Tahoe near there. And uh, we were spending, I don't know, three or four days. And I brought a book with me that was recommended by the same spiritual the same spiritual advisor, director, the spiritual father, if you will. And he said, you know, that this was a really good book, Open Mind, Open Heart. I'm not here really promoting the book as much as just I brought this book with me. And I spent the weekend reading it. And it really, it teaches censoring prayer. And in that experience of reading that book, you know, he talked about how, you know, it's one thing to try and understand God, you know, but there's a part of scripture that talks about God being beyond understanding. You know, that his ways aren't our ways, his ways are beyond our ways, you know, and, and at that point in my experience, you know, I was, you know, trying to understand God, but I had never thought about sitting with God without trying to do the talking, without sitting with God and maybe just listening, about sitting with God and maybe getting all of my ideas out of the way of who I am and what I think is important and, and what I thought was important to for me to be for other people, you know, the ego starts moving in, you know, and so anyway, it was pretty scary, frankly, to sit down and find out who God is, because it's one thing to experience God out there, you know, in God's creation, which he certainly is, you can walk around and see God everywhere, but could God possibly also be living in my heart? And to experience that God, maybe I have to be quiet, in the teachings of Thomas Keating, who spoke open mind, open heart to let go of my thoughts, maybe just for 20 minutes. And frankly, that was a pretty terrifying thought. I mean, I'm, I'm not overstating that word of terrifying. To actually sit and let go of my thoughts, it's like, what's going to happen to me? You know, where is this going to take me? You know, it, but I started trusting again, you know, my spiritual father. I started trusting Thomas Keating, you know, that this was going to be okay. And he was assuring me that it was going to be okay. And so I started doing it, beginning with that cabin experience. And I couldn't really tell you how long, you know, weeks, months. But there was a certain time that passed, you know, where it's like, what does this have to do with prayer? You know, I mean, there was a lot of fears, anxieties, a lot of other stuff going on. A lot of my stuff was still showing up, you know, and still trying to move back and let go and sit and be quiet again. But eventually, I could tell something was happening. I mean, I really couldn't tell you what was happening. You know, but there was something. I was asked to do it 20 minutes a day, every day. You know, and so I faithfully did it. 20 minutes seemed like two or three hours. I just looked, 20 minutes up, oh, like 10 minutes, you know. Just, a, you know, finally, 20 minutes would hit. I did it. I did it, you know. And, but I was faithful to it, and I stayed with it. But there was a point where I, tell, I could tell something good was happening. And I, I knew, based on my reading, that I needed to be with a centering prayer group to grow with this journey. And so I thought, well, you know, Mike, you really don't know of a centering prayer group, although they have them here in Sacramento. But I wasn't personally involved with one. I said, why don't you just start one in the prison? You know, so I took my book, you know, I read a couple books and went in, and I just started, you know, telling a few people wherever chance I had, because I was already going into the prison because of the prison ministry I had. But I could tell this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to teach this because I wanted to grow in it, and I could tell there was something good happening with me. But a few people in the prison, particularly these three fellows named, they call themselves the three docs. They, I don't know if they had, they had some medical backgrounds too, and they were well educated. But one of these three docs heard about what I was talking about, trying to lead people into this inner journey. You know, I mean, we've all had this outer experience of God, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, I mean, we've seen God's hand. You know, now whether we recognize it, it's another thing. But to go on an interior journey, particularly in this culture, it's not something that normally happens unless you have some guidance. This culture, you know, is not a culture, you know, that puts a lot of praise or recognition to sitting quietly and doing nothing. Most people, it's wasting time. And Thomas Keating would say, yes, it's wasting time. You're wasting time with God. You're wasting time listening. You're wasting time listening to see if there's somebody else there 
who lives with you, who is a part of you, that goes where you go. You know, and not just where you have to go to God, but God goes with you. And, you know, I got so caught up in that, I forgot where I was going. I mean, that's really, that's really what it's all about. I wish I could just spend the rest of the time just talking about that journey, but I'm here talking about a prison ministry. Um, well, these three docs came together, and they had a plan, as it turns out. They wanted to start a meditation group in the prison, and they wanted it to spread throughout the prison. But now their background was in Eastern meditation, you know, Hindu, Buddhist types of meditation. And there's all kinds of different meditations, but it's really an acceptable thing in the East to sit and rest in God, in the Buddha nature, or whichever you want to call it, getting yourself out of the way and experiencing yourself outside of your ego. And these three docs heard about me, and they came to me, and they started asking me what the centering prayer stuff was, you know, and so I sat down and explained it to them the best I could. Well, on the book, you know, because I really was, didn't have it quite down pat myself yet. But they got to looking at it, and they said, you know, this will work. This will work. In fact, this will probably work better than the Eastern meditations, the purely Eastern meditations that we have, because we're in a Western culture, you know, and in the Western culture, we're, I mean, we just have a different way of thinking than the people in the East. And a lot of people probably in the prison aren't just going to show up if they're going to show up to a Buddhist meditation group or a Hindu meditation group. But we have, you know, Christians coming from a tradition, you know, of close to 2,000 years of meditation. And there's people that practice it. And we now have uh, folks that are putting out here that meditation is something that's a part of our Christian tradition also. And so what we did is we ended up coming together. Yes, if you're willing to teach centering prayer, I'm willing to join with you. But they felt that centering prayer would be much more acceptable to the prison at large than them coming in with their meditation. So what they agreed to do was to go ahead and begin a group and introduce centering prayer as the beginning, foundation, for anybody that would want to come and, and be a part of our meditation group. Oh, the three docs were prisoners, yes. And so we went ahead, and they somehow arranged a Friday evening where we would begin our group. This was about four years ago. We started off, and I personally just wanted a little group, maybe six people, and just we would grow together, just us six. That was my plan. These three docs got together, invited a few people on a Friday night. We had about 13 or 14 began with an introduction to centering prayer. Uh, within a few weeks, you know, we had 20, and it went to 30. By the end of the year, we had 50. And then after that, it went to 70, and 80, and 100, 150, 200. The last count, I'm told, and I, I don't keep track of this. I'm not here to tell you that each one of these people has this intense meditation, you know, daily meditation. But anybody that comes to this group, they are taught centering prayer. They are encouraged to do that meditation on a daily basis. Uh, we began a contemplative library so these people can take the information to their cells and pray with it, uh, go more deeply with it. Uh, the last count I was told that there's over 235 people that are participating with us. We're only allowed to have 50 people attend each meeting on Fridays. That's the limit that the uh, prison system puts on us, and so these people have to take turns attending each of each of the centering prayer meetings. Um, what occurred over time was these three docs decided that they should have a peer counselor group, and what they did was they selected some of the people in the fellowship call it contemplative fellowship, stressing the truest meaning of that word, fellowship, in a place of mistrust, you know, where people, you know, don't put themselves out for other people because, you know, who knows, you know, who they can trust in a prison. But we began a fellowship, and over time people did begin trusting each other, and they formed a peer group, 
peer counselor group in that prison where people who want to teach this, who want to go outside of our group and share it, you know, with people outside the prison. Uh, so they take a five-month course in order to study a spirituality, to study centering prayer, to learn how to present this, not just to people who are Christians, you know, but, but when you sit down, when I sit down, and we have this false self, you know, we all have, it doesn't matter whether we're Christian, non-Christian, whatever, the ego, you know, that's trying to make us acceptable to everybody around us. You know, but in, in Thomas Keating's teaching and our Christian teaching, we're taught that if we can move that false self out of the way, the only thing that's left is God. It's this true self. The true self who is me. Now, the true self isn't God, but it's one with God. And it doesn't matter who you are, that God is an indwelling in each and every person. One of the peer counselors that we had that teaches this, and Thomas Keating talks about it as being divine therapy, uh, his name's Michael, uh, the night before last, it's traditional for when a peer counselor is, is getting out of prison, he has the evening to share. And Mike is a super intelligent guy got up there, and Mike shared uh, his way of, of describing centering prayer. And you can describe it many, many different ways as far as trying to get the point across. But in his sharing, you know, his last evening, Mike made a statement that really hit me, particularly coming from an inmate, because we always have new people there. And he told the inmates that were there, some of them knew, he said, you know, you can come here, you know, and there's a lot of people here that have been centering for some time. You know, and you can see, if you get to know them, that there's a kindness there. There's a gentleness. There's a spirit within them that not only just cares about themselves, but cares about you. That cares about people outside these, this little room here. That, that cares about people outside this prison. You know, little will you know that before they started centering prayer, they were vicious killers. They were murderers. They were violent people. And you can't tell which one it is by meeting them today, that are in this room right now. You know, and it's true. It was true. I sat there. And I know some of the stories behind some of these men. And if you don't know their stories, you wouldn't think that you were just sitting right here listening to these people. And again, these people teach divine therapy. There's a therapy here. There's a therapy that allows God to reach down and take the junk and throw it out. And let it float out and come back and rest in God's love. This crap comes up, and I mean crap. I mean, think about it. You know, you're talking about a lot of people that are in prison, convicts for life. They aren't in there because they stole the bicycle. You know, there is stuff in there. There is woundedness. There is hatred. There is bitterness to the extreme that you could ever, you wouldn't even want to know. But these men, through centering prayer, through this divine therapy, you know, it's allowed to come up. When it comes up, it doesn't come back. And a little more comes up. You know, and Mike, uh, Mike did a wonderful job sharing, you know, because he had spent a lot of time preparing, you know, to share it. And he had been sharing with other inmates, which is why we have such a large group. You know, people like him going out, sharing with a celly, sharing with people, you know, out of the yard, you know. And not out there. We're not out there evangelizing, trying to drag people in. It's just that at first, you know, we were a laughing stock of the prison, you know, but not anymore. You know, the prison system even respects us because they see what's going on. It didn't happen the first year. I don't even think it happened the second year or the third. But this last year, there's a respect that's occurring within the prison. You know, not just with administration, but prisoners who would not set a step into a chapel. No way. That's, you know, I'm not going to do that. You know, that's for church rats, you know, which you know, terms for people like that. You know, but seeing what's been happening to some of these big macho guys out there that are leaders even in the prison system, you know, coming and growing and something good is happening, but even those barriers are breaking down. So that's the reason it's, it's growing. Another uh, fellow that, uh, that really touched me, who gave his last presentation, he was a peer counselor, and he was a Mexican fellow. We called him Casper, you know, and he came in and he got up and he had his piece of paper and he was kind of writing some things on the board, you know, and it was like, you know, I had really no idea what, what he was trying to talk about, you know. 
finally he puts his paper down, you know, and, and, he, and he starts sharing. He says, I got to tell you. And he says, when I showed up to this prison, he says, I had a bad attitude, man. He says, I came in here and people would just look at me. And I look at him and say, hey, man, who you looking at? You looking at me? He says, I had a bad attitude. But I started coming here. You know, people made fun of me, but I heard something good was happening in this place. And when I hear something good's happening, I show up. And people laughed at me when I started coming here. But when I started coming in here, the first time I was here, I knew I belonged here. And so good stuff started to happen. And I kept coming back. And guards would sit there and they'd look at me. And I wasn't supposed to be here. They could get me for breaking out. Because I wasn't supposed to leave my cell at times when they had the door open. But I'd walk by because I wanted to be here. And I had a place to go. And I looked like I wanted to go. And I walked right by them. And they looked at me and they knew I had a place to go. So they didn't stop me. They didn't ask me where I was going because they could see I had a place to go. But I could have gotten in big trouble for doing that. But I wanted to be here. And now my friends respect me because they see what's going on inside of me too. And it's like, I don't want to hurt nobody no more. And I sat there, and it's like, I don't know what you got, but tell me about it. You know, he couldn't tell you about it very well, but you could tell what he had was very good. And what he had, even I wanted. And it's like, oh, yeah, I already know. You know, but this guy gone much farther with it than myself, you know, which is really kind of what's neat about the prisoners. You know, these guys, I mean, what do they have? You know, they ain't got nothing. And maybe for good reason. I mean, they've done some stuff. You know, they need to be there. You know? But then you have people that have realized that maybe I ain't got nothing out there, nothing you can give me, but I got everything. You know? And when I leave these walls, it ain't going to be because I'm going to be out there looking for God, because God's with me. And when I leave, God's coming with me. And if I never leave, God is already here with me, because a lot of these guys are lifers. And their desire is to reach out to some of these people. Some of these people who are going back to wives. Some of these people who are going back to kids. You know, these kids that never knew their dad or knew a violent dad. You know, and the gift that these lifers have is to reach out. Because they're the ones that never leave. You know, the lifers have been there for four years. You know, it's, we've probably seen 500, 600 people come and go in our group. Each one of them have been taught censoring prayer, you know, by their fellow inmates, you know, and when they go out, they're looking forward to being back with their mom. They're being, looking forward to being back with their kids, you know, and being a father, you know, and maybe having kids that aren't going to go to prison because their father came home freed, you know, from their addiction, you know, freed from the need. And addiction comes because you're in pain. And you can't sit here and, oh, you're addicted. What a jerk. You know, if you don't know what the pain that a man is suffering you know, and what he goes through to avoid that pain, whether it's alcohol, you know, drug addiction, you know, pornography, you know, even the violence, you know, is better than the pain that they have inside of them. And if we don't know their pain, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, oh, poor inmates, you know, I mean, we need prisons, you know, but there's a reason they're doing stuff that they're doing. They're in pain. And when they experience the freedom that it comes from this kind of meditation, this divine therapy, where it's continuously, daily being released, being released, you let go and you go back to your sacred word and, your intention to sit with God again. And this crap starts coming up again. You say your sacred words so you can just sit with God again. You know, and you start realizing, wow, I'm not as angry anymore. You know, I'm not as mad anymore. You know, and eventually they start realizing, wow, you know, maybe I don't need that drug. Maybe I don't need that alcohol. I'm not hurting as much you know, over time. And it doesn't mean they don't stop what they're doing instantly. But what they do notice is, I don't need it as much. I'm doing it, but this isn't my God. This isn't going to save me. You know, because it doesn't mean right away, you know, oh, I'm free, I'm free. You know, it's, it's these people start noticing, and they know that this is not what's going to fill the hole in their soul. Maybe they're still doing it a few more times. But it's the difference between doing something, thinking it's going to fill the hole in your soul, and having nothing else, versus doing something, knowing it's not going to fill the hole in your soul, and have experienced God within. You know, the journey, you know, going inside, which fills, which, which is everything. You know, I've watched inmates get up there and say, this is everything. You know, these are guys that ain't getting out somewhere. This is what I've always wanted, I've found. You know, this is a monastery, people. 
people. This isn't a prison, this is a monastery. Using their words. Uh, there was a point about six months ago, I was sitting here watching all this stuff unfold before me that I realized I gotta tell somebody. You know, initial, initially I did the teaching. I haven't taught Centering Prayer in a long time. The inmates do that. The inmates reach out. You know, and after watching it, it's like, I got to tell somebody outside these walls because I'm the only guy that's going back and forth outside these walls watching what's happened over these last four years. You know, now my ministry really is just what I'm doing here. This is actually the first time I've actually talked to a group. You know, we have some articles here that I asked the inmates to write. We got it published in some... Uh, some uh, papers that have gone all over the country, all the states of the Union. I'm getting re correspondence from all over the country for people being amazed, you know, what's going on at Folsom Prison. You know, people aren't coming back to prison. You know, there's an 80% re recidivism rate. It took me three weeks to learn how to say that word. <laughs> I still stutter, but I can get it out. Um, my wife knows I put it up on the wall. <laughs> Every time I walk by, I would say it just so I could use it today. Um, but there's an 80% return rate you know, of prisoners. That you're just expected to, to come back. We really only know of one person that's returned. And when that person came back, they asked him what happened. He says, you know, I did good for eight months, you know, and then I stopped doing my daily sit with God. I stopped censuring myself. And then before I knew it, you know, I started thinking about drugs. Before I knew it, I was getting back with my own friends. A month later, I was dealing drugs, and here I am. You know, so that by itself, you know, is quite a quite an interesting thought. So, the first article that we came out with that the inmates wrote was meditation in Folsom, just telling what was going on. Then we had a fellow who's been out for a year, and he wrote an article, meditation after Folsom, the importance of continuing the meditation, the medication, if you will, on a daily basis. You know, and uh, these are what's announcing to people on the outside all around the country. I've also gotten some responses from Canada and uh, England, you know, wanting to know what's going on. You know, and my purpose right now isn't really to do anything but to plant the seed out there, you know, for this uh, powerful, powerful century prayer. You know, I want to say ministry, but wherever you go with this, you know, it's going to change people's lives. But the prison really is, is an incredible example of what it can do. You know, frankly, you know, we need that inner journey just as badly as any man in prison. Just as badly. You know, just because we're outside the prison walls, you know, doesn't free us from the hang-ups. You know, and, and you don't even realize the hang-ups we're talking about until you go on this journey, because the freedom that comes from, from experiencing God here is the true freedom. And not in my perfection. You know, that God loves me just the way I am. Unconditional. You know, and not just something, you know, that we heard because, you know, we hear it. But how do you get it that extra foot and a half to hear? You know, but that's where the change comes, you know. And that's really what Centering Prayer does. I'm sure there's many other ways, but, you know, my own personal journey is that's how I experienced it. I brought it into the prison, and it's like, wow. So, you know, I'm hoping uh, there's a few places that's starting out. I'm going to be visiting a couple prisons here, introducing some groups that have already started, you know, only seven or eight people. And it's not really about numbers. You know, I look at I look at uh, Casper, that fellow I told you about. You know, what if he was the only man in four years, you know, that experienced what he experienced? What a gift. You know, a man, you know, who has kids who are going to probably be subjected, you know, to his angers and fears and whatever, you know, that, that could end up landing them in prison, you know, and instead maybe those kids won't be going to prison, maybe he's going to have a marriage that's going to be the kind of marriage that God intended to where they're growing together in God's love, loving each other with God's love, loving their kids with God's love. You know, if it was just one man, you know, forget 200, 500, 1,000, if there was a ministry of just one person, you know, what a gift. Thank you for having me.